Uh, I'm a solution architect in uh, Microsoft Services, um, and I'm part of a team uh, which is a global uh, Windows and Devices uh, team that works pretty closely with the engineering team, as well as with kind of early adopter customers that are um, on, the, on the edge of uh, the technologies that we deliver. My, me personally, I uh, only work on Windows 10 Mobile, um, uh, not on desktop, but uh, Anders here is part of uh, my team, and uh, he's a, a, a desktop guy, right? But he loves mobile too. So, um, I have a clicker. Yesterday we, uh, we uh, covered uh, things like identity with Azure AD and how it integrates with the mobile device management to do configuration management and with the Windows Store for Business so that you can get your business applications onto the devices. What, what, we, what we basically covered is the three first sections of uh, the device lifecycle, right? Deploy, configure, and apps, um, which gets the device ready, configured for the user with everything they need to get it functional. I have a few devices here that we configured yesterday, all with the same user, but doesn't really matter, right? Everything is now on the device, it's configured, uh, except one thing, it's not on the device. There is no Windows information protection. So I'm cutting it a little bit to the edge in the sense that I will deploy that policy in a minute and hopefully the cloud will be with us and, uh, and the devices will receive that policy uh, before I need to demo uh, actually what the result of the policy is. I'll also talk about enterprise edition and managing updates on Windows 10 mobile devices. So enabling IT professionals to control when updates go to these devices so that they can be tested before they are deployed uh, and don't interrupt the business user uh, in general, right? And then I'll, I'll cover some uh, aspects of retirement of devices as well as migration of Windows Phone 8 devices to Windows 10. How many of you uh, do have Windows Phone 8 devices deployed? All right. Percentage-wise, that is more than yesterday um, uh, because, uh, well, uh, yesterday I think it was about 25% uh, of a larger group. I think today it's more like 40% uh, of you, right? So we'll cover that uh, at the end. Sounds good? Um, I'm totally open to interactive, so if you have questions, uh, please ask them. If you have the chance, go to a microphone to ask your questions. Uh, if not, I'll repeat them. So uh, people that uh, get the stream will also be able to hear them. So I'm going to cover operate and retire. I'm going to start with compliance management. Compliance management is not new to Windows 10, it's new to Windows 10 Mobile. With the anniversary edition, uh, we uh, included Windows device health attestation, right? And by that, conditional access based on health of the device. Um, in my experience working with customers, not too many have uh, used it today yet, right? So it's pretty new for a lot of people. But obviously, the demand for conditional access in general is pretty high uh, from a customer's perspective. Uh, the way this works on a Windows 10 mobile device is exactly the same as on a Windows 10 for PC device, right? It uses the same uh, infrastructure uh, and, and, and the process is exactly the same as on a Windows 10 device. So when a user that has enrolled is device in Azure AD and is managed with mobile device management, as we saw yesterday, right? It's now configured. A user has um, a, a key pair on the device and is using that to authenticate. In the authentication process, um, it gets a uh, authentication token, right? And it then gets also a uh, access token for an application, being it Office 365 or being it um, uh, other applications, uh, wireless that they want to access, for example. At that point in time, the MDM server can actually request the device to or the, uh, the application server can request the device to, uh, to tell them if they're healthy, to provide a certificate, a health certificate for the device. And within that process, the device goes back to Azure AD 
and Azure AD goes back to the device integrity health state service, which is a Windows server in the Microsoft Cloud, right? Which brings me to an, a point that I don't immediately have a URL for, but it's a good thing to go and look on TechNet if you're deploying Windows 10 and Windows 10 mobile devices to look at what the cloud services are and what the uh, firewall addresses are, etc. Some customers are really uh, are struggling with that, right? So make sure you don't filter out the traffic for those services because that would mean that the service won't work on some of these devices when they are on your corporate network, like Wi-Fi, etc. It's kind of a side note. But in the process of this device and user authenticating, they're going to this device health integr integrity service, get a certificate if they are healthy, right? Um, there is a, uh, a great white paper that I'll show you immediately on, on TechNet that shows you what are all the elements looked at, amongst other things, spoofing of the TPM, those kind of things in terms of what is the overall health, is the device rooted, etc. you can call it, is the device jailbreak broken or not, right? And it gets a certificate when the device is not jailbroken, right? When there's no on uh, cryptographically unsigned code running or uh, those kind of things. And uh, the certificate is then provided back to the MDM server who allows access to uh, applications through conditional access conditions that you have implemented in your MDM server, in your management server, right? So it's um, identical, I would call it, to Windows 10 for desktops that are uh, in the same way cloud connected and cloud managed uh, as such. I don't have a URL on the screen, but um, this article explains the full process and how to configure it on, and it's control the health of Windows 10 based devices on uh, TechNet. Uh, and walks you through the full process as well as how to set it up with Windows Intune. If you're using, oh, we're no longer calling it Windows Intune, it's Microsoft Intune. So how to set it up with Microsoft Intune if you want to do that. So information protection. Information protection is new to the anniversary update or uh, 1607. Um, it allows uh, the, U, the IT professional to define uh, what information belongs to the enterprise, what applications are trusted applications that can access that information and how the user can access that information. In, in other words, the channel the user can use to access the information. And that information is encrypted at the, the file level, so to speak, and uh, protected by the MDM system, etc. cetera. Um, the, um, uh, the user cannot share that information. I'll go much more in detail in a minute, but I'm just giving the overview. Cannot share that information with non-trusted applications or locations. And in the locations, a space, right? If the user tries to save a file outside of the container, so to speak, uh, the, the, the information will be encrypted and kept encrypted with a certificate or a key specific to that user, right? So nobody else can actually unencrypt that file and get access to it. Whenever a user saves to a trusted location, the file will not be encrypted. The data will not be encrypted. By definition, data on the device is a non-trusted location, right? So anything that is saved to the device is automatically encrypted when it comes from the enterprise. So you have two layers of encryption, if you want, right? BitLocker, which encrypts the full disk, and then Windows Information Protection, which does additional encryption on top of that uh, on, at the file level uh, itself. So before going into details, I'm gonna go back to seven and deploy the policy, right? 
I'm using Intune, so I'm using Internet Explorer. Um, just have a look if I need to re-authenticate or not. No. Nope. So these are the uh, configuration policies I set uh, yesterday, right? I have uh, pref uh, deployed an email profile, uh, some security policies like password policies, etc., to the device, uh, and I have also uh, blocked an application. I think it's WhatsApp that I blocked, I blacklisted, right? And uh, I need to uh, I, I need to deploy the Windows information policy uh, to uh, my devices that I created. And I'll go through all the details. So I'm, I define the trusted applications, what the uh, uh, policy mode is, what the domains are, et cetera. And I'll go in more details uh, on that. I'll save the policy and deploy it. And I'll deploy it to make it simple to all users. I only have one active user in this system, but anyway. Uh, so I deployed this. I'm going to, um, at the same time, if I go here, this is a 930. Uh, unlock it. I'm going to go in all settings under accounts, under access to work, so the device shows as unrolled, right, in this Azure AD. And I'm going to force the device to sync. Yesterday, I explained how this is a session-based protocol, the MDM protocol. So you connect, the device connects to the server. And within the session, they exchange information. That's what they are doing right now on this device. And I'll also do it on the other one. I'm going to show you that immediately. You know, yesterday we were in Murphy, and um, I uh, need to back up. And sync. So they're both doing it. So hopefully the uh, cloud is with us. Let's uh, go back to that a little later. So more details first. How does it work? Um, market data. I actually read yesterday another case of a healthcare service provider in the US who lost one phone. And the one phone had 480 records of patients on them, and they had to pay a $168 million fine. So losing a phone uh, can result in uh, serious costs for your, uh, for your company. And healthcare providers in the US, you have really big ones, but you have small ones. You can be a small local hospital, et cetera, right, with just 280 patients, and there you go. So it's important to protect information. I think you, we all know that. Um, how does Windows Information Protection help with that? So we, obviously, we have BitLocker on the device. Let's do some additional stuff to protect that information. Windows Information Protection makes a separation between personal and enterprise data, personal and corp company data, right? Uh, and uh, not just data, it also makes a separation between enterprise or personal uh, versus enterprise applications or trusted applications, we call them. And it also makes an, a separation between enterprise locations and, and personal locations of information, right? You must explicitly define what your enterprise apps, locations, and data are, right? Defining the data is usually done by defining where the data comes from, what your enterprise location is. Anything that comes from your enterprise location and is stored outside of the trusted realm, right? Outside of the container, if you want, on the device or outside of the uh, um, uh, corporate environment on a Dropbox or a personal OneDrive or something like that will automatically be encrypted with a personal uh, encryption key of the user that, you, uh, that is generated for the user. And you can back 
up or escrow uh, the uh, private key so that you actually always have access to the data if, if you need to get uh, data that is somewhere stored and decrypt that data. Anything the users creates and saves into your enterprise will be unencrypted so other employees can actually use it and people can collaborate in the normal way uh, as such. There um, is a, a, a kind of apps that can be what we call enlightened apps, right? If you take Outlook or Word or Excel or PowerPoint or OneNote uh, as a few examples, uh, others uh, could be uh, like the photo app on a phone, um, can be enlightened apps. Enlightened apps are apps that use a special API, which is freely available. If you want to apply it to your uh, enterprise uh, applications, you can use that API too, right? That will tell the, or will make the application understand what Windows information protection is and which data to encrypt and which data not to encrypt. Because enlightened information, like Outlook on the phone, can be used by a user for enterprise email or personal email, right? They could have a Yahoo email address or a Google email address, those kind of things on their phone, and use uh, those. Right? So Outlook knows it's coming from Google. I don't need to encrypt it. It's coming from Office 365. I need to encrypt it. Right? Now, the reason why I deployed my policy this morning, and I'm kind of cutting it to the edge, is that yesterday I deployed these devices, and I did not apply Windows information protection immediately, because there is a caveat if you want something we need to smooth as Microsoft. Uh, if you do that, and you apply policy, and that includes email, et cetera, right? your email profile will be deployed but non-functional because what will happen? The settings on the device, right, the profile data on the device will be encrypted and will not be readable in that first stage of deployment. So lesson learned is when you try to apply Windows information protection, deploy a device, wait until the device is configured, which you can read in your MDM system normally, and then move the device into your WIP security group, right, in Azure AD, your Windows Information Security Group in Azure AD, so that the Windows Information Security policies are applied that you define it in, uh, in Intune, right? Don't apply Windows Information Protection policies before your device is properly provisioned in the early stages of a deployment, right? So otherwise your deployment will fail. So we need to smooth it out. We need to fix that, right, as Microsoft, to make sure that uh, um, um, you actually can deploy immediately with Windows Information Protection applied to a device uh, before um, or, or immediately, right? Windows Information Protection works exactly the same on desktops, laptops, tablets, phones, etc. You don't need to create separate policies for desktops and, uh, and phones. The only difference being that if you have a desktop application like uh, Office, um, uh, native Win32 Office on a PC desktop, right? Uh, you need to make sure you have the right version. I think it was just released from uh, uh, Office 365 uh, to support uh, desktop-based uh, Windows information protection or for information protection for desktop applications, I should call it in this case, uh, Office. Uh, information sharing on the device is policy controlled. And um, uh, the easiest way to look at that is that when a user tries to copy something from a, uh, from a Word document that is uh, enterprise to a Twitter app that is non-enterprise, uh, the, the, the policy can prevent the user from doing that with a block policy. The, the policy can allow the user that, so to overcome that, right? They can say, I'll make this uh, file personal in instead of uh, uh, enterprise and decrypt it for the user. Or the, uh, you can have a silent policy that just tracks what the user is doing without actually popping up anything for the user or blocking the user from doing anything. 
So when they save or when they get an email with an attachment, and it, the Excel file, they copy something out of the Excel file, they want to uh, paste that into a personal app like uh, Twitter, uh, it will be blocked or silently allowed or allowed with a pop-up that informs the user of what they are doing. They can obviously copy to another trusted app like Word without any problem, uh, but saving that to another location will automatically um, um, encrypt that uh, information uh, on, uh, um, on the, the, the personal storage drive, right? The OneDrive or the Dropbox or what have you. Again, uh, I'll talk about it in a minute. And then uh, uh, obviously if they save it to a, uh, um, a OneDrive for business, uh, people would be able to save the document there as a OneDrive uh, for business or to a SharePoint, they would be able to save it there, right? The uh, OneDrive app, um, yesterday, and I'll talk more about updates today, we also uh, said we're doing a monthly update. Uh, October monthly update 10B will be released somewhere around the 15th, together with the desktop version. Has an update for uh, Windows information protection, and uh, there will be a new version of the OneDrive app that is more aware. A OneDrive app is at this point in time not an enlightened app. Right? It's an enterprise app or a personal app at this point in time. So just to let you know, in a month or so, we'll have an update for OneDrive to make it more better behaving uh, in the Windows information protection world. And uh, so the policies are blocked, as I said before, preventing the user from doing uh, stuff, override, which enables the user to um, um, uh, uh, decrypt the file if you want, right? Uh, when there is a, a file there or audit, which is silent uh, as such, and the user won't actually see anything. It's a good idea to use silent as a, a uh, proof of concept or pilot mode. In many cases, um, it seems straightforward that users are using enterprise data, etc., with applications. In many cases, uh, IT doesn't know everything. Does that sound weird to you? So in silent mode, you can actually track what users are doing for a while so you can apply your policies appropriately and trust applications and, and et cetera in, in certain ways. You never know how the, micro, uh, the marketing department is using the Twitter app, right? Or how the... Uh, the marketing department is working with partners or whatever, whichever department is working with external parties and you need to enable them to do their job and not block what they are doing. So um, making sure you know that, understand that, profile the users correctly and then apply policies on certain target groups is really important in this space. So let's see if the policies have applied. Where are we? Seven. I'm going to know that if I open a document. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. Oh, you don't see anything? Uh, no, it's not information protection. That's for sure. It's a sleeping PC. Here we are. So I downloaded a, um, a document from a SharePoint server. I can go back and uh, open Word again. Right. I think I took a, a product strategy. Yep. No, oh, it's another one. It's from OneDrive. I did not protect OneDrive. Let's take this one. I'm going to save it. I'm going to save a copy of this file to my local machine here in Documents. OK. I'm going to say, and no, 
policies are not there. The reason I say that is because I don't have the option to, to call it a, a uh, uh, enterprise file or a personal file. All right, let's save this one to my device. In documents. I don't think the policy is here yet. Because I'm probably be able to Copy stuff. Go to Twitter. Obviously, Julia is giving the day's overview, as she does every day, and paste it. So I'm still able to do this. I'm going to force another session, and I'll come back to the demo in a minute, in a little bit. All right. Repeat, I wasn't listening. Yes. Yes, you would be able to uh, create a report uh, to verify the policy on uh, if policy is applied on the device. And so you can show kind of in real time uh, in terms of compliance. Uh, let's go to seven. Right. Let's go back to Intune, um, groups, all users. My user is card. Here it is, card four. That's my user. Um, he has policy errors, so uh, we're going to immediately see on what devices, probably on three Windows phones, right? Mm. Which one is this? This is the uh, X3 I have here. Come on, Cloud. Now oh, here are guards' phones. This is the nine thirty that I showed on the screen. And the policies that are applied. Um, data protection policies seem to be applied now. So it says conform. So they conform uh, to um, what I imp implied. The device has told them, yes, I have applied these policies. Right. Shall we try again? <laughs> All right. Ooh. Let's open the viewer.
not sure it's actually applying the policy, to be honest. No, no. Well, Excel is, um, as you can see from the icons on the screen, Word actually is not protected for some reason. Uh, but you see on my screen that Excel has this, uh, uh, and PowerPoint have these icons, right? So maybe I d um, did not properly define the Word application. Oh, do I really need to update it? I guess I have to. Uh, it did configure Excel and PowerPoint and OneNote properly, but not Word apparently for some reason, and that's in my policy, so I'll launch it. And use it. I'll open a PowerPoint. Copy the data. Oop, that's too much data, I guess. That's enough. Copy. Go back to Twitter and try to paste that. It's still not protected. Let's try a new one and paste it now. No, still not protected. I'll go back to it. It should be. Um, just waiting a little bit uh, to make sure it, uh, policies are properly applied on the device itself. So um, it requires universal applications. Uh, Edge is one of them. You can trust Edge, uh, which enables you to give it access to intranet portals, et cetera, as well as PDF files and keep them encrypted if the policy is well uh, applied. Uh, all the inbox applications, I said there is a, this issue with OneDrive, which we will update in, uh, this month in, in the October timeframe. Um, and um, all the Office apps are enlightened applications. As I said, if you want to apply these uh, um, settings to your own line of business applications, you can use the API to add that functionality. You obviously can use any application and say it's a trusted application. In that case, it will not be able to access any unencrypted or data from a personal store. It will only uh, or all, always encrypt all data, right? If, uh, even if that application is being used by the user to access some personal information, it will encrypt that data uh, as such. And applications, uh, if they are trusted, they will also encrypt settings, et cetera. So it's important to take that into account uh, when you apply it to your applications itself. You can deploy it with uh, SCCM or um, uh, Microsoft Intune. Uh, you can deploy it with third-party MDMs uh, as such. Uh, I don't know where they all are. I know uh, BEST 12 supports it at this point in time. I don't know if AirWatch and MobileIron have already implemented uh, uh, Windows information protection within their systems and when they release that support. But I'm sure they will announce that pretty quickly. They were all very enthusiastic about this. For network policies, and I'll go back into the console and show you some of the policies and which ones are required, um, you need to have a VPN infrastructure so that uh, uh, per app VPN, your trusted apps knows which VPN profile to use to access uh, information within, behind your corporate firewall. And the VPN profile itself includes 
settings to make it compliant with Windows information protection uh, and manage that with your MDM environment as such, right? Uh, TPMs are not optional and uh, encryption keys, etc., are automatically protected. With the, are not optional in Windows mobile devices. They can be on a tablet or something like that, right? But a Windows 10 mobile device always has a TPM in the SOC to enable uh, protection of the keys uh, as such. All right? Silence mode is a good target. Um, uh, way of uh, deploying it, and it's important to um, uh, try it out with a number of users within your company before you actually uh, start deploying it in a wider space. But I think that's um, a rule that you would apply to any technology, new technology that you uh, deploy within your organization. So I'm going to try this again. And I'm going to go into uh, my policies and go over the policies that I have defined. And these are not necessarily the user interfaces, obviously, obviously specific to uh, Intune, but not necessarily uh, the policies are those that you need to apply. So I gave it a name, right? And the top. Oh, thanks. So I gave the policy a name. I also defined uh, uh, apps, and I have Word in here um, as such. Also Outlook, Photos, Excel, etc. Uh, the way to uh, define an app is to give it a name, then create a publisher uh, of that app. Right? Uh, you see, this is a pretty long string. Um, this is how Microsoft, as a publisher, pu publishes applications. So the publisher name you see here is uh, valid for any Microsoft application. And then uh, the product name as such, which is Microsoft.Office.Word. The way to find uh, these, uh, um, that data, I should say, are all multiple ways. Uh, the easiest way is go to the store, copy the URL, and the uh, application has a unique uh, identifier and use that application uh, to uh, get the, the application manifest that will give you the publisher plus uh, the, uh, the data. You can also use uh, um, on a desktop PC, right, that runs the same application. The application needs to be installed uh, to do this. You can uh, use PowerShell uh, to do uh, get Apex uh, packages and that will list all the Apex packages installed on your PC and will give you the publisher and the name of the application, for example, right? Uh, Outlook and Calendar are one application on a phone, so it has one um, application name. There are not two separate applications. The Contacts or the People app are different applications. Oh, wrong mouse. So if we look at Outlook, for example, Right? It's called the Windows Communications Apps uh, on a device. The same on a Windows desktop, uh, by the way. Right? So define all the apps that you consider trusted apps. All the apps have to be explicitly defined here uh, in that section uh, as such. Uh, the way it's done in Intune is obviously by app. Uh, it may be different in another MDM vendor's uh, uh, product. And then you have the uh, policies here, right? Block, uh, override, silent, or off. You can obviously turn it off. And that will decrypt all the information that is being stored on a device uh, at the file level. Not the bit locker, but the file level Windows information protection encryption will be turned off. And then uh, this is an essential and required one. Uh, you need to define your corporate identity or your domain. Uh, right? Uh, this is not a very vanity domain, but uh, it's a domain, and you need at least to require a IP range and your network domain names uh, with, uh, that store, your, that define your intranet. You can also define cloud-based locations, etc. You can have very long IP ranges, uh, so it takes a while to, for you to look at this, again, before you define it, to make sure that you actually have all your 
intranet locations and IP ranges, etc., which makes deployment um, at this point a little complex. And we're certainly working on um, uh, how to smooth this better and make it easier uh, to deploy. Because if you add a location, right, you can add um, required enterprise network domains and IP ranges, uh, but you can define uh, all kinds of uh, environments. If you want your users to go through a proxy, or they have to go through a proxy to access these resources, you can add an IP range plus the proxy uh, address that they need to go through. If it's a domain name, the same thing, domain name plus proxy uh, that they need to go through to access those dom uh, domain sections or subdomains. And then, um, we defined apps, um, policy, I, uh, identity, uh, locations. And then you need to uh, generate a recovery certificate on a, um, a device that doesn't have um, uh, enterprise um, file system encryption uh, enabled or WIP enabled, the Windows Information Protection enabled, and use uh, the CERT and the PFX to one escrow it, and the other one publish this uh, um, recovery certificate uh, to all devices, so you can actually have access to all the files that users have stored on their devices uh, as such. And that's probably kind of it. So you can set a, a few other policies here. Um, so revoking the uh, recovery encryption uh, key from the device when a device is unenrolled. Uh, in show or not show these icons on tiles or on files. Uh, they will also show up in the file system. So users will see which files are actually encrypted with uh, uh, Windows Information Protection and which ones are not. And uh, something specifically for the UK, I would call it, is th this is the UK feature <laughs> because it was requested by uh, CESG, um, um, the UK um, security agency for the government uh, to be, in, uh, be able to throw away the encryption keys when a device is locked. So if you turn that on and the user locks the device or the device times out, the encryption keys of the device will be removed from RAM until the user unlocks them again from the TPM by entering his thumbprint or uh, a pin code to unlock the device. Um, this is a protection against direct memory access attacks uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, right? When somebody has the attack and the device is running and they can uh, physically access the device through a USB connection or something like that and try to read the RAM, um, uh, without this feature enabled, the encryption keys of the device would be in the RAM because the OS is using them to decrypt files. The OS is using them, for example, to sync email while the device is in a, in a sleep mode, right, in a locked mode. Um, you can throw them away by enabling these specific uh, features. And then whenever the user unlocks the device, the, the OS will, um, uh, using the, the, the code entered by the user with the pin or the thumbprint, uh, um, unlock the TPM, read the keys again, and start synchronizing, etc. So it has a certain performance impact, although very limited and in most cases not very visible. Um, unless there is a lot of email and those kind of stuff. Any questions here? No? Going to quickly see if the... Um, Yeah, it would, it would give a pop-up that says um, you are doing something uh, that you shouldn't be doing. That's why I have the override here. Yeah. 
950 and 950XL, or the X3 from HP. Right, policies are applied now. As you can see, the um, safe uh, interface has changed. The user has now the option to say, I'm going to save this as a personal, because it's in override mode, or a uh, corporate uh, file, right? And I'm going to save it as a corporate file in this case. And you can see now there is a little um, briefcase, right? Uh, next onto the device means this is a, actually an uh, encrypted file now with uh, Windows information protection. I'm going to uh, just reopen it. It's already open, but right. Um, copy some stuff. can still copy it. I would uh, be able to paste it somewhere else, uh, like in Twitter, which is a non-trusted uh, app. And at this point in time, the user would get this pop-up saying, change uh, this content to personal instead of corporate, right? Because this is override mode. Uh, if, uh, and they can uh, choose that. Your company is actually tracking uh, what you're doing, right, uh, as such if you are opening it. If I do OneNote, no. <laughs> Let's get it later. Hopefully, this version of OneNote, oh, I need to do it. Otherwise, I can't open it. <laughs> All right, update it and be quick. Obviously, this also shows like single sign-on with uh, applications once the device is enrolled in Azure AD, etc. User never has to authenticate against Office 365. It automatically does that. And I'm going to add a page and paste it in here, and I get the same thing uh, because this is uh, my personal OneDrive notebook and not an enterprise uh, OneDrive notebook. Any questions? Let's talk a little bit about Enterprise Edition and Update Management, which is a subject that um, uh, other people already asked me about. So uh, with Windows 10 Mobile, any Windows 10 Mobile has the core SKU on a device, right? Uh, on a phone or what have you. Uh, you also have the Enterprise Edition. And the Enterprise Edition specifically allows you to uh, defer updates, postpone application of updates being its uh, 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 quality updates or security updates that we release every month, as well as feature updates, right? The Windows anniversary update was a feature update, and we will usually do around two feature updates every uh, calen on a calendar year basis. So it enables you to manage those updates, and I'll, I'll give you some more details about that. It also enables you to set telemetry levels, right, to a lower level or whatever level you want. So Microsoft doesn't catch all this uh, uh, information about uh, phones in terms of how they perform and uh, et cetera, um, uh, if you want to block that. And it also allows you to install more than 20 self-signed apps. We did away with the um, 
Uh, was it a VeriSign or a semantic certificate, signing certificate required to sign apps on Windows Phone 8.1? Uh, well, you can still use it if you have it. Uh, but you can also generate your own signing certificate with your internal CA um, and use that to sign your Windows Universal apps and distribute those apps. On a standard Windows Phone, you can distribute per phone 20 of those apps with your, uh, with your own signing certificate. If you want more, you need to upgrade to the Enterprise Edition uh, as such. Right? You can apply the uh, Enterprise Edition uh, license to any device by uh, going to your uh, volume licensing portal, whatever volume licensing program you have, download the volume licensing file, which is actually on a CD. Uh, it, it's an XML file. Um, and um, uh, you can I downloaded. If you have an MSDM subscription, uh, you can actually download uh, that uh, ISO, right? It's a CD. It has only this XML file with the enterprise license. And uh, the enterprise license looks like this, right? It's not a real license, this one. I changed the keys inside this license file, but it's an XML file that you need to use. On, an, on a desktop, you can use a key, a product key to upgrade a professional SKU to an enterprise SKU, right? In mobile, you need to use a, a license file like this one to upgrade a standard or a core to the enterprise SKU. You can apply that using a provisioning package. With Windows ICD, you can create a provisioning package, include this file and apply it to a device, or you can do it with a mobile device management system uh, as such, right? And, and uh, provision that to the device. We recommend you only use Enterprise Edition on corporate-owned devices because there is no way to downgrade a device from Enterprise Edition back to, your, to the standard uh, core. So when a user is bringing their own device and you're applying this license, they leave the company, they walk out with your license, right? It's not that they can go and use that license on another device, but the device itself now has a certain value that you uh, paid for uh, as such. Right. So apply it only to uh, corporate devices. That, anyway, that's our recommendation. Sir? Right. It's a good question, yeah. Right. So um, uh, updates on Windows 10 are delivered by Microsoft, and the carrier is not intervening in us releasing updates. Right. Um, uh, obviously, they have visibility to our update mechanism, etc., and they uh, they get early access to our updates and what have you. Uh, but they don't have a go, no go button uh, for updates to the OS. We do our monthly updates as we have been doing since November of, uh, of last year uh, on a monthly basis and they don't need uh, any approval from the mobile operators uh, worldwide. Right, but with AT&T, they are the ones that delivered the anniversary update. No, they don't. Microsoft delivers the anniversary update. So Microsoft uh, distributes the anniversary update to Windows update services. Um, and you can even go like with the anniversary update to uh, with WSUS to the catalog and download the update from there and distribute it to WSUS on an on-premises environment if you want. Right? So it's not the mobile operator who delivers you the updates like with Android. Um, it's like with iOS if you want because uh, for uh, iPhones the update is delivered also directly uh, from uh, Apple, right? So all the updates come directly through the Microsoft Update Channel uh, to your devices uh, as such. So uh, the way we have released 1511 in November of last year, right, as the current branch, and I'm using this Windows as a service terminology, right, current branch, uh, we have also delivered a current branch uh, with a Windows uh, anniversary update, which is another release of the current branch. 
In between, we have been releasing monthly updates right, uh, that um, are, have been available to any uh, device. And I'll, I'll go into how a device sees an update and stuff like that in a minute. Uh, and we also have declared a, uh, a, a CBB or a current branch for business on the 1511 release, right? That happened around March of this year, so about four months after the release of the CB, the current branch, we Microsoft say now the current branch is ready for business, and we call that the current branch for business. I'll, I'll explain for, to you why this is important uh, in a minute. So anniversary update, same thing. We release the current branch, and after a while, approximately four months later, we declare that update a current branch for business. Now, uh, I'll come back to this one. Why is that important? Uh, you have, when you update your device to the Enterprise Edition, a number of policies. And I'm using here the uh, CSP policies as they are described in the CSP documentation. So for those who are not in the room here, if you go to ak.mscsp, um, which is the, uh, the, the page that documents all the CSPs or configuration service providers that are configuring the device, right? There is a CSP that enables you to defer updates and uh, they use certain values. In 1511 and 1607, or 1511 was a November release, right, of, 50, of 2015, 1607 is the anniversary update, uh, 2016 July, although we released in early August, but in a way it's a July uh, update, right? We are changing the naming of this policy, so your MDM system needs to support this. But in both cases, you can apply a policy at any point in time and saying, next time Microsoft releases a feature update, like the anniversary update, don't apply it to my devices. Wait until Microsoft declares that update ready for business with CBB, which is approximately four months after we release the release, right? That's when we declare. The CBB will include cumulative updates that we have released on a monthly basis in between CB and CBB. And I must apologize for this acronym stuff um, because it's, um, <laughs> for us uh, working in this space, it's very easy, but I, um, I imagine for you it's a, a little difficult. So if you are an enterprise, you can put your devices on the CBB train which gives you four months to test the new features before you deploy them to your existing devices. Now, there are other updates, right? The ones we release every month, which we call quality updates or security and reliability updates. They're packaged cumulatively every month and released to existing devices. You can also postpone or defer those updates, but not for four months, right? You can Postpone those updates for four weeks if your device is still on uh, 15.11 <coughs> or 30 days uh, if uh, your device is on 16.07. So it gives you approximately a month to test security and quality updates before they get released to your devices. Okay, so you have approximately four months for feature updates and approximately one month for uh, quality or bugs or uh, security fixes, uh, et cetera, as such. Whenever you're rolling out an update, right, after this four months, after this 30 days, uh, the update starts to roll out and you discover a critical issue, you can pause the rollout of those updates to your devices for an additional 35 days. It's a pause, you put the pause button, you can turn back the ones that have already been upgraded to, with the update, right? But the other ones won't receive it for an additional 35 days, right? You obviously open a support ticket at Microsoft and say, we have a big issue, right? Let's uh, fix that together uh, as such. And then there is a, uh, uh, update experience definition policy set that allows you, some updates will require the user to click a license agreement or something like that, right? Um, or, um, and I'll, I'll go back to my previous slide, the way updates come to the device influence the user experience. 
and you can define that user experience, right? If the user is uh, interrupted in any way or needs to click a, and accept a license, etc., by um, uh, doing that. To keep track of updates, uh, the two bottom line URLs are important for you. Go to the Windows 10 release info page as well as to the update history page because those pages give you when we are exactly releasing updates as well what is in the update. So you have an idea of, okay, I have now 30 days. Microsoft tells me that is in the update. I need to make sure I test whatever needs to be tested uh, to make sure that it works for my devices. These updates are released, generally speaking, for all devices at the same time, any model. There is no difference between models, et cetera. Uh, as such, we release them all at the same time. There may be a difference of about a week in what we call open market devices versus mobile operator branded devices, right? So if the gentleman asked me, AT&T needs to approve updates, right? Um, it could be that he has an experience that uh, some devices bought through, I don't know, expenses here in the US that are European devices from the open market were being used and they got an update a week earlier than uh, the devices that he bought from AT&T, right? Because we usually stage open market about a week, but that's not a rule. Um, we are trying to uh, uh, leave that week out too and just distribute the update for all devices at the same time. So going back this slide, how does a device know when an update is coming? And I have experience with customers where the device never connects to a Wi-Fi network, which is an issue, right, um, uh, in some cases. Because whenever the device is on a cellular network, the device will scan whenever the device is put in use for the first time, immediately if there is an update, and after that it will scan approximately every 24 hours. It could be 22 to 27, but approximately every 24 hours, every device will go up to the Microsoft Update Service and say, hey, have you, do you have an update for the operating system? It will do an auto-scan, as we say. It will do an auto-download if the device is on Wi-Fi. If the, uh, at that point in time it says, hey, there is a uh, update for you, it will start doing a background update, a download from Windows Update to the device itself. It won't do that if it's on a mobile operator network. It will wait until there is a Wi-Fi network available, unless, and don't ask me the numbers, because there are many mobile operator networks in the world, right? Mobile operators have a general definition of download size uh, that goes over their network, not just for Microsoft, for any download. And if the download is smaller than a certain size, they will allow automatic downloads uh, over their network. If the download is bigger, they will block that download, and then the device has to wait for a Wi-Fi connection to be able to update or download the update. Once a device has downloaded the update, it will immediately install the update. The user will not be impacted, right? It won't see it. There may be a performance impact for the user, maybe, right? But generally speaking, the update is installed immediately. That means it's staged on the device. And then the device will wait for active hours to end, right? You can define in your MDM what are active hours, from 7 in the morning to 5 in the evening, or something like that, or 9 in the evening, or whatever the, the thing is. And then it, the device will automatically start in, uh, rebooting, auto-reboot, outside of active hours. So when it ends at 9 p.m., the update is installed, the device will reboot, apply, fully update, and make itself again available to the user. Right? It will not do that when active hours are ended, if the user is on the phone, right? Or if the user has an option to say, if it's working with the device, it will get a pop-up at that point in time, and the device will say, I'm gonna restart to do the update, and the user can say postpone, right? So postpone the update. Then the device will try again 24 hours later, outside of active hours. It will do that for seven days, 
And after the seven days, if the user is not on a phone call at that point in time, the device will automatically reboot in outside of active hours and, and will be updated. Also, there needs to be enough uh, uh, battery power. 40% is the minimum before an update is applied. Questions? If an update is not uh, successful, the device will automatically roll back to the previous uh, um, version of the OS that is installed. This is for OS updates, quality and feature OS updates, right? This is not for applications. Apps are updated by the store. If the Office team updates the Outlook app or the Word app in the store, right, the device will, in its 24-hour scan, discover that there is, through Windows Update Services, that there is a new version of Word, and will update that version of Word in the background for the user. Unless the user is using the, the application, will wait until the user stops using the application and update the app. Right? There's no user visibility to it unless there is a new feature or something like that. This is separate from uh, our, the update cycle that I was just talking about. There may be other update cycles, like, um, for example, uh, the store for business may make new uh, features available in the cloud service. And they are not uh, following the cycle that we just talked about on a monthly basis, etc. They have their own uh, cycle. And uh, I think the Office team also has published what their cycle is approximately about for applications. You have a question, sir? Yeah, what about firmware updates? All right, that's a good question. <laughs> and maybe you uh, refer to uh, AT&T updates around firmware updates. So we update the OS. In most cases, we don't need to touch uh, the BSP on a device, the firmware, right? The, uh, the ones that uh, uh, manage the baseband of the device and, and, and the sockets, et cetera. If for some reason the device manufacturer as a firmware update, we will go through a process with mobile operators to approve that firmware update. The reason for that is because if it's baseband impacting, it impacts their network. They want to make sure that whatever the networking stack is uh, on the device is actually working properly on their network, right? Um, I think the 950 and 950 XL rece received a firmware update two months ago or something like that. Right? Yeah, which is Qualcomm based because it's part of the SOC, right? Uh, network uh, Qualcomm based. But if it's OS updates, the stuff I talk about now, nobody else is involved but us. Sometimes we will push a firmware update like we did with the 950 and the 950XL. It comes through the same pipeline, right? Uh, via, via Windows update, but it needs approval of mobile operators. It doesn't happen a lot, and we are not planning doing a lot of those, but it can be needed. And it can be needed on, er, let's call them, early uh, new models that are coming to market from OEMs. They may be releasing one and then within the month to a firmware update because they discovered an issue on the firmware itself. How are we doing? Five minutes left. So any questions around update management? So you need to upgrade to Enterprise Edition. You can defer updates. Uh, you can influence the experience of the user on updates, uh, et cetera, right? And um, that's kind of it. All right, troubleshooting. Uh, there are a number of troubleshooting tools when you are working with Windows 10 Mobile. You obviously don't have the same troubleshooting tools like you have on a desktop, right? A desktop has a ton of this Win32-based troubleshooting tools uh, as such. A uh, uh, phone doesn't have it. I think there are um, um, a number of elements that you should look at when troubleshooting. And if you are um, opening a support ticket with a Microsoft support around Windows 10 Mobile, your support engineer will ask you to do certain things, amongst other generate logs, etc. cetera. Uh, on any device, the device itself obviously generates logs. Um, and um, oh, sleeping PC. 
It's really me. All right. So here we are again with the 930. Okay. And a hanging app. Yep. So within your uh, settings under um, accounts, access to work or school, right? Uh, you have export your management log files. You see the uh, uh, down here all the way in the bottom the in, in, in green, the terminal text. So this enables me to export MDM diagnostic logs that are generated on the device uh, as such. You can actually use your MDM to define granularity of these logs, etc., that need to be saved and if they need to be generated or not uh, on a device, right? Um, uh, but if you do, you can export them. The moment you export them, I'm going to my file explorer, I'm going to go this device and in documents, there will be an MDM diagnostics folder that gives you uh, the diagnostics files. This is actually an XML file. You can uh, read, right? We're working on a PowerShell tool that enables you to convert these XML files, but it actually goes through every single setting on the device, right? Uh, and uh, defines what the setting is on the device at that point in time. So we're working on a PowerShell script that we'll publish that enables you to convert this XML file in an HTML file and make it a little bit more human readable, but you can easily use Microsoft uh, or Visual Studio Code or any XML viewer uh, to, through, to run through the XML file and look at this. Support engineers will ask you for this. Yeah. Is that true with configuration manager controlling it, or is it just with MDM controlling it with MDM? Um, I'm generally saying MDM. Uh, I don't know if System Center Configuration Manager 16 version, whatever we are at this point in time, uh, uh, if they already have implemented it, yes or no. But in the general policy is if uh, the soon as we have it in Intune, it will uh, pretty s very soon be available in System Center if you're using System Center in a hybrid mode or in a standalone MDM mode uh, on, on your system. So yeah, it should be. Uh, plus, you could use what we call OMA URIs. I don't think uh, setting uh, logging is, uh, has any exec execute command in the OMA URI, so you could uh, use OMA URI or a custom policy as, uh, as it's called in the Microsoft MDM tools to do that. Then, um, just in the interest of time, I think there are two tools that I would uh, recommend. Uh, one is Field Medic. Uh, Field Medic is an app in the store. Uh, anybody can download it and it enables you to uh, generate uh, logs on the fly on your device, right? If you have the device in hand, uh, generates apps and look at those logs immediately uh, to get more information about it. And then another tool that is available in the store is the Certificates app. It's just plainly called Certificates. Publisher is Microsoft, also for the Field Medic app, by the way, right? Don't use any of the other apps that look at certificates, but the certificates apps on the device allows you to look at uh, uh, certificates installed on the device to e eventually diagnose problems uh, with that. And we are kind of enhancing those apps and are trying to, from a diagnostics and apps perspective, bring everything together into one uh, environment. If it's going to be an app or uh, how it's going to work has not been clearly defined, but we're uh, clearly looking at making this a more an uh, easier thing to do. Let's put it that way. 
And then uh, last one, <coughs> uh, Team Viewer. You know, we have Team Viewer support in Intune. We have also now have Team Viewer Remote Control app on Windows 10 Mobile. Uh, if you have a Team Viewer subscription, you can use it to remotely control Windows 10 devices in the field and uh, and and help the user or change a configuration on the fly or look at what the user is experience, uh, etc. The um, Ability to do remote control is not limited to TeamViewer. We're working with other ISVs to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to help them release their remote control app. Uh, TeamViewer is just the first one, and I didn't want to hold back on that because it's a highly requested functionality to be able to support people uh, in the field that have uh, mobile devices, and you want to help them from a support help desk perspective. Uh, you can full wipe or enterprise wipe. Um, this is not really new. Uh, it's important to understand what is wiped. If you are doing a uh, enterprise wipe or you retire your device from a bring your own perspective or uh, if it's a corporate liable device, I would actually recommend to do a full wipe on the device, not an enterprise wipe. Um, but uh, you can uh, remove all the configuration, applications, data, settings, etc., that are on the device uh, in a secure way so the user can walk out of, that, uh, of your environment with their personal devices needed and deliver and, 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 and still have all their email, etc., on the device that they had before. Your MDM system is also capable of reading the result of an enterprise wipe. Um, before it disconnects from the, uh, the MDM, so you actually know exactly what happened uh, on the device as such. So some of you have Windows 8.1 devices, or Windows Phone 8.1 devices. There are a number of challenges with uh, updating Windows Phone 8.1 devices to Windows 10 that we are uh, aware of. Uh, we are at this point in time in a... Um, um, in a request mode, right? A device will not, uh, Windows Phone 8.1 will not update a Windows 10 unless it is requested by the user or through the MDM system. Uh, uh, the user would do that by installing the uh, Upgrade Advisor app and be able to request the update. If you do not want your Windows Phone 8.1 devices to uh, install Windows uh, 10 Mobile, uh, blacklist the, uh, the uh, Upgrade Advisor app. That's the recommendation I have uh, for you. So just blacklist the app. Users will not be able to install it and request the update. Right? That's the way to block uh, any updates as such. Uh, there is uh, obviously um, time that is required to do the upgrade, and the upgrade from uh, phone 8.1 to 10 is, uh, uh, can be pretty long. Uh, there can be issues around your MDM enrollment, certificates, whitelisting, blacklisting of apps, some functionality that was available in Windows Phone 8.1 that's no longer available in Windows 10 Mobile, those kind of things. It's important to look at those. So if you want to know what all the known issues are, um, you can go to the uh, release or the specifications page, right, the, uh, the, the bottom URL and have a look at what all the issues are that, are, are that exist. It's not that there are a ton of them, but there are some uh, specifically around whitelisting, blacklisting. Do you have a question? Yeah, so you're saying you can block users with the uh, advisor app. What about blocking them just having an insider and then upgrading from that? You can block that insider app too, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. I would block blacklist both. It's a good uh, uh, um, question and, and suggestion, actually. Yeah. Also, all, uh, not all devices are upgradable to uh, Windows 10, right? You know that some of the lower-end devices are not upgradable to Windows 10. Um, if you want to control the update uh, yourself through your MDM, uh, at the KB article 3150204, if it's the only thing you want to remember, is remember that number, 3150204. Um, it gives you the opportunity to create an OMA URI policy that will set a registry setting of the, on the device that will block the update. Or no, that would initiate the update for you. If you want to say, I'm going to start the update now, 
right, for my devices. You can set that policy on the device, change that registry setting, and as a result, the devices will automatically go and find the update uh, uh, for Windows 10 for that device, if it is available for that device, obviously, right? That's something you need to check with Windows Update Advisor uh, as such. It's an OMA URI. It uses the registry CSP uh, to change the registry setting on the device and, uh, and go and, and get the update. The update path is um, multiple steps, right? It's not a single step. It's an update, first of all, to the initial update release the 15.11 release, or 10.58.6.11, which was the release that we released in November of last year. The reason for that is because this is an approved mobile operator update. When we were on Windows Phone 8.1, operators had a go, no go button for any update, right? And uh, we needed to create updates that were, uh, went through the approval process with the mobile operator. So it will go to that update first, then apply the first or the latest quality update for that platform, and then apply the, uh, the, um, the uh, anniversary update update. So it's three steps. So Windows 10, first quality update, anniversary update. So it's a long process in many cases if you haven't updated these devices yet. And you may never update them, right? I know customers who will never update the devices. They will just wait until they replace the hardware for those users and buy them new phones or uh, new devices. Questions around Windows Phone 8.1 update? If not, please do your evals. Uh, we appreciate your feedback. And um, well, if you still have questions, I'm around um, and uh, come and ask me. If you want uh, um, everything I talked about over the last two uh, uh, um, days, right, in a document format, uh, we have the management uh, guide. I wrote it myself. It's great, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the security guide too, by the way, so that's one, one is great too. Go get those, and um, uh, it will uh, uh, set you up for success. And uh, I would say thanks. Have a nice day and a nice Ignite event for the rest of uh, the week.